Hello, and welcome to the College of Continuing Education webinar, Design Better Software, a Domain-Driven Approach. Thank you for joining us. My name is Elena Gallagher, and I will be your moderator for today's event. If you have any questions about this webinar or other programs we offer, please feel free to contact a learner representative in the Information Center. Contact information for the Information Center can be found on the last slide of this presentation. There are a couple of logistical points I would like to address before we begin. You can feel free to submit questions at any time during the webinar. The questions you submit will be addressed in the last 10 minutes of the presentation. To submit your questions, click the Q&A button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Then type your question in the box below and click Send. We will be sending out an email in the next few days with a link to the recording of this webinar. The link will be sent to the email address you submitted during your registration. In today's webinar, we will expl be exploring the world of software design. We will be focusing on how to ensure your designs are always good ones by implementing a domain-driven approach. It is very important to always start off on the right foot. This concept definitely applies to software design. We will address how to lay a good foundation on which to build your software house. Finally, what good is being an excellent designer if you aren't able to articulate the value of your design? You will learn how to showcase your value to project managers and stakeholders. I would like to introduce today's speaker, Ken Riley. Ken has a master's and PhD in computer science from the University of Minnesota, where he is also an instructor of information science and computer science. Prior to his instructing career, Ken worked as a senior technical manager for 3M's Electronics and Energy Group Laboratory. He was also a subsystem designer for Lynx application at Cargill, and he contributed to the development of the original .NET platform at Microsoft. Ken has published a number of academic papers regarding tracking, mapping, mobile applications, and computer science education, and is a frequent speaker on topics such, such as RFID tracking and information management in healthcare, and using elliptical curve cryptography to combat pharmaceutical counterfeiting. Without further ado, I give you Ken Riley. Thanks, Lena, and thanks everyone for attending today. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to first uh, mention a few folks who have helped uh, to contribute to the material that you're about to see. Uh, first is Mats Heimdahl, who is the head of the Department of uh, Computer Science here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, before becoming department head, Mats was in charge of the Master's of Science in Software Engineering program, which is where a lot of this material originated. The uh, current head of the MSSE program in the U of M Software Engineering Center is Mike Whalen. And then uh, Professor John Collins, who originally developed a lot of this material in the class from which this material is derived, uh, is now retired, but I give him credit for a lot of what you see. And then finally, Kevin Went, who has uh, taught with me the past few years uh, this material in the MSSC program. For those of you uh, tuning in, you'll find this material interesting if you're a professional software engineer or architect or if you manage software engineers or architects, I've specifically included some information for folks who, uh, who manage developers. And uh, for those of you who didn't know or realize that software design was actually, is actually a, a separate discipline and something to be studied, I think you'll find this presentation uh, very eye-opening. As we move through the material, I'm going to assume that uh, you have some familiarity with uh, object-oriented vocabulary as it relates to software. And so some of the terms you see, uh, such as an object, an interface, uh, you know, relationship, aggregation, composition, and so on, uh, these terms might be used uh, throughout today's presentation, although uh, for the most part we try to keep it at a fairly high level given that we only have uh, a little under an hour to go through the material. So I'll first start out with why spend time doing software design? I think typically uh, we start to we start down the path on our projects and uh, maybe we have a little bit of an analysis phase but then we usually start writing some code uh, if not uh, coding a little bit earlier and a lot of times we don't think about design and so that leads to a design, not necessarily a good design, but uh, a design that can be difficult to maintain uh, down the road. Um, there's clearly a cost to spending time on software design, and so we have to understand what the value is. And in a, in a, a few slides here, we'll talk about 
how good software design can actually reduce overall cost of the system. Um, we have some life, life cycle issues as to when we actually do design. Uh, and then the fact that uh, software design is often expensive now, but saves us money later. And because of that fact, we often skip it and choose to deal with the uh, problems that bad design creates uh, down the road rather than in the present. And then also we have some process issues to consider as to whether or not most uh, corporate or enterprise software development processes actually allow time or recognize software design as a separate, um, uh, a separate uh, phase in the uh, general software development lifecycle. <clears throat> the primary reason to spend time on your software design is that good design reduces your overall total cost of ownership. To give you an idea of how expensive a software system can be, uh, Gartner has published numbers uh, about five years ago and they came to the conclusion that on average for every one dollar of implementation cost, maintenance for that same uh, you know, production enterprise code will cost about 77 cents uh, per year for every dollar it costs in implementing it. <clears throat> they also noted that the average uh, system has a life of 15 years. Uh, and so if you draw out those 70 cents a year over 15 years, uh, you find that maintenance amounts to 85% or more of the total cost of ownership. All this is to say that if you can find a way to reduce the maintenance costs of software, uh, then you can reduce your total cost of ownership actually much more than you can finding uh, inexpensive ways to implement uh, software. And the trouble is most uh, IT managers will reason about system implementation based solely on the upfront implementation costs. So how much it, needs, uh, it costs to develop, how many developers you need to hire, how many hours you need to put in to build the system. Uh, and occasionally we'll account for maintenance, but not nearly to the degree that we actually realize uh, maintenance. And the trouble is we pay design costs now. Uh, so if we were to spend more time on design, we would pay those costs now, whereas maintenance is a future concern uh, for future budgets. And so as a result, we'll often choose to forego uh, spending time on maintenance instead of opting to incur those costs down the road. So with that as kind of a background for why we would want to do software design, uh, let's talk through software design as a discipline and the steps involved. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about how you can get more experience hands-on with some of the techniques that we'll cover here. <clears throat> software design is a process. It's typically undertaken early in the software development life cycle. Occasionally, we undertake it later in the software development life cycle. This is usually when we realize that we have a bad design and it needs to be improved. The design itself uh, kind of the material form that it takes is a set of artifacts and in particular in the object-oriented world one of the things that is commonly uh, the, the most common artifact I would say of our software designs is a UML class diagram that represents the system either that's been built or the system uh, to be built. The uh, class diagram and the set of artifacts that constitute the design will we'll explore other artifacts as well um, often form a sort of blueprint for the code. And so if uh, you want to continue the analogy, our software design is our blueprint and our code is uh, you know, the framing and our building, the materials, the actual construction of the physical, um, you know, the physical building. Um, design has uh, a long history just as software development methodologies have evolved over the years. Um, so has the discipline of software design. In general, uh, software design uh, has, you know, the yesterday's uh, software design method becomes integrated into today's uh, programming tools and that fosters the creation of new design methods that eventually will be integrated into software design tools. So, for example, um, we've long been able to create uh, class diagrams in external programs such as uh, you know, Visio or the Rational Suite and uh, eventually we got to the point where we could take that class diagram and actually export it into a set of at least stub uh, working code. And so that we 
we, uh, with that step, we kind of blurred the line between the actual design tool and the development tool. And then as we get more sophisticated, uh, you'll see that today uh, unit testing tools and other things are often uh, able to work off of declarative um, implementations uh, instead of having to explicitly translate some of these things into code. If you've taken um, any uh, uh, kind of introductory uh, computer science or if you have a computer science background or a computer science degree, you were probably taught, uh, at least uh, early on in your program, about functional decomposition as uh, the primary form of design. So you start by, uh, you know, kind of laying out your system and the steps that need to be uh, accomplished in the system, and then you decompose that into a set of manageable pieces. We often learn these as functions or subroutines or procedures. And then so the story goes uh, that uh, uh, as software systems became larger, this procedural or functional decomposition uh, no longer sufficed. It was uh, too difficult uh, to manage code bases as they became large. And so we came up with uh, alternative design methods that eventually led to uh, the object-oriented methods that you see in common practice today. Uh, however, uh, OO decomposition methods are still a form of hierarchical decomposition. You usually start with the uh, kind of overarching uh, domain, and then you break that up, and many of us were taught to look for the nouns in the problem description, and those became candidate classes. And then we look for verbs in the problem description. Those became candidate methods and so on. One way to do this <clears throat> that we've taught uh, at both the undergrad and the graduate levels for a number of years is with something called CRC cards. CRC cards stands for Class uh, Responsibility and Collaborators. And essentially these are a set of um, you know, usually three by five index cards where you write down your candidate classes some notes about their responsibilities and some notes about the other classes that they interact with. I'll have an example coming up in the next slide. Um, UML has evolved the unified modeling language and so and this is where you typically create things like class diagrams, sequence diagrams, state machine diagrams and so on and these diagrams help us um, visualize the uh, design and interaction of our software before we actually invest time in building it. Then there's a few other models that we'll make passing mention of, such as uh, general responsibility assignment. Um, and then also, within the object-oriented world, if you were to take one of our classes, we would delve deeply into the notion of architectural and design patterns and talk about how to apply those. Uh, however, for today, because we're short on time, we'll make passing mention and then invite you to join us for one of our programs where we can explore that uh, in a little bit more depth. <clears throat> Other ways to organize your thinking. There's a um, popular paradigm and actually we'll focus um, a topic of this webinar on something called domain-driven design. And this was uh, popularized by Eric Evans in his book, Domain-Driven Design, which I highly recommend. Um, also responsibility-driven models, function-driven models, and then use case user-centered design or process driven which is usually driven off of data flows and more uh, standard or traditional uh, business analysis techniques. For the purposes of this webinar we'll focus largely on domain driven design. <clears throat> In domain driven design the uh, basic uh, unit of design is something called the domain model and the idea is to develop a very comprehensive domain model and that will form the core of your design. We'll talk in a bit about what constitutes a domain model but for the most part you can visualize your domain model as a UML class diagram that lays out all the classes in your uh, program uh, or your system as well as assigns them particular roles or archetypes and uh, allows you to you know, essentially model the real world in your software. In this case, you'd identify uh, entities, uh, factor out descriptions as value type objects. We'll talk about what each of these mean. And then also look for services that may not be associated with specific entities or that may be specific to the system that you're 
um, generally uh, designing. In a responsibility-driven model, um, you would assign uh, responsibilities to various subsystems. So rather than uh, explicitly attempting to model the real world, what you would do is identify the responsibilities of the overall system and then decompose those into smaller responsibilities. And this is a technique that we often use with the CRC cards because the R in CRC stands for responsibility. Here is an example uh, that uh, we use uh, in our classes to illustrate CRC cards. In this particular approach, you would write down each candidate class on uh, uh, something like a 3 by 5 index card, maybe a post-it sticky note, and then you would indicate the class's responsibilities as well as the, the class's collaborators. So uh, on the right-hand side here, under collaborations, you see a list of candidate classes that this particular class would interact with in a given uh, design. We, uh, this model is simple and sometimes easy to understand, and so we continue to teach it a lot in our undergrad and graduate courses. Finally, you look at different design perspectives. Um, you know, the conceptual view is uh, used uh, oftentimes in, um, in a, in a domain-driven context where you'd break the system down into a set of objects and responsibilities. In a contract view, your design consists of um, a set of classes, but also interface contracts that uh, you know, basically allow you to make a commitment that, uh, in kind of a black box way, that something will work uh, as you expect it to, and uh, that uh, incoming values will be within certain ranges, uh, and so on. Um, and then implementation view, uh, which is looking at how a lot of the stuff that we might uh, draw in a tool like Visio or Rational is actually translated into code. We often use UML uh, for the conceptual and the contract views. And of course, contracts, <clears throat> if you're uh, in active development, you know about tools like Javadoc that can essentially export uh, the contract information so that you can... Um, you know, view it or publish it or release it along with the software. <clears throat> the primary um, uh, topic, I guess, of this webinar will be look at domain-driven design and in particular at domain modeling as an approach. In domain modeling, we attempt to model the real-world problem that our software is trying to solve in a set of classes and methods and responsibilities that uh, uh, you know effectively mirror the language and the vocabulary of the real world, real world problem that we're trying to solve. <clears throat> a domain model, uh, the best way to visualize a domain model and the most common representation is with a UML class diagram. However, there are other things. The domain model is essentially a collection of artifacts that uh, contribute meaning uh, in a coherent and consistent way. And again, Evans was a big uh, proponent of this form of software design in his book, Domain Driven Design. And so he feels this is the beginning and the heart of software design. But in any case, domain model might be a, uh, you know, a UML class diagram with some supplementary information, might be sequence diagrams, uh, a vocabulary or a glossary, uh, and other artifacts that help contribute meaning to the eventual uh, 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 domain model. <clears throat> Here's a simple example of a domain model uh, represented as a UML class diagram, and this is from Evan's text. Uh, in this particular domain model, we have a set of classes, uh, so for those not familiar with UML, each box represents a class, each line represents a type of relationship between classes, and then you can see also we have some notes as well as some other annotations that help contribute meaning uh, to the overall model. The idea in developing a domain model is that your list of classes uh, and the boxes on your diagram are uh, essentially models of 
or, uh, or have real-world analogs in your business problems. So in this case, uh, we've got cargo, a particular itinerary, a leg of that itinerary, and so on. In uh, Evan's approach, we take great care to transfer the vocabulary of the problem domain uh, into the, um, uh, uh, the domain model as much as we can. Um, so in this case, we might have discovered you know, this, this particular domain model, or arrived at this particular domain model by interviewing users or potential users of the system. And we would take great care to make note of the vocabulary that the users were using and be sure that we translate that into our uh, class diagram uh, of our domain model. <clears throat> we use domain models prim primarily as a communication tool. Uh, when I teach both my analysis class and design classes, you know, I ask uh, students or I tell students that the primary purpose of what we do in these phases is communication. Communication between developers and users, uh, communication between analysts and developers, communication between developers and testers, and so on. Um, we often have an intuitive concept of what our domain model should look like uh, in our head. And so, in a sense, the process of domain modeling is really writing that down in a structured way such that we can communicate it and gain agreement on the, uh, on the uh, domain model <clears throat> itself. But it also serves as a link uh, from the domain to the application. And again, it's key to bring some of the vocabulary from the domain into the domain model so that we can, uh, you know, when we're relaying this information to users, when we're talking to users, that we're talking about one and the same thing. Um, and then as a representation of the uh, overall architecture of the system. So we talked about a class model, or excuse me, a class diagram being kind of the core of a domain model and it's certainly the most common representation. But other things uh, could be part of a domain model. So if you can imagine it as a set of artifacts, in a sense, uh, figuratively stapled together, um, that, rep that all together sum up to represent the domain model. It would be the UML class diagram plus potentially a glossary, definition of terms, vocabulary, uh, rules, uh, relationships, and so on. Um, and then within the domain model, you might also have informal drawings. Uh, some of the CRC cards could play a role in there as well as uh, all the different types of UML diagrams, package diagrams, sequence diagrams, class diagrams, state machine diagrams, uh, and so on. You'd also include relationship to other artifacts that might be considered uh, outside of the domain model, such as a formal requirements document um, and uh, examples. Potentially use cases could be in or out of the model depending the level of detail that you would write your use cases as. And then there are uh, a number of peripheral potential artifacts, too. Your software code could be considered part of the model, as well as information about your contracts. And then uh, if you had an ERD or entity relationship diagram that described your data model, that's a good candidate for inclusion in the data model. UML <clears throat> is good for representing relationships among things. Uh, it's often not good for illustrating complex sequences or flows of information. Data flow diagrams might be a better choice for representing the flow of information among components or among systems. We talked about the importance of including a glossary or ontology uh, in the domain model. And the idea here is to get <clears throat> a general agreement on what certain terms mean. So, uh, a few slides ago, we had the example uh, domain model. We had words like itinerary and leg. Uh, we each have our own intuitive notion of what those mean, but our intuitive notions might be different from one another. So it's important to discuss those differences and agree on a standard uh, definition. UI might be part of the domain model as well. And then uh, examples or artifacts from the domain. So if it involves a particular form, slip, receipt, so on, all of those could be included. <clears throat> Business rules might be included in the domain model as well. And uh, we often know business rules as things that we implement in the eventual software design. Um, so these are examples from the domain of uh, the University of Minnesota. 
Uh, if a student successfully registers for a course, then we charge tuition to the student's account. Um, we might have descriptions of certain workflows. So I, I know here at the university we have quite a bit of paperwork that we pass around. And a lot of that paperwork has certain uh, you know, routings that it must follow. People must sign off in a certain order and so on. So those descriptions of those, those workflows might be uh, included as part of the overall domain model. Then constraints. Uh, and again, without regard as to where the constraints might be implemented in the final design, um, they could be included in uh, document form as part of the domain model. Here's another example of a UML diagram. This is a UML state transition diagram. <clears throat> this type of diagram is used to illustrate the state of a particular object or the life cycle of a particular object, the events that cause it to change state, and the, uh, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the eventual end of the life cycle and termination of the object. One quick anecdote, I remember that uh, in one of my first jobs uh, as an intern, uh, I spent the summer developing a state transition diagram, I spent the whole summer on this particular project, and uh, it's harder than you think to gain general agreement on the, the particular set of states that a given user interface, for example, might go through. And I found the diagram to be extremely useful uh, in, uh, in bouncing ideas off of stakeholders and potential users. Effective domain models. Uh, we don't want to create, a, in a sense, excess documentation for no reason. Uh, so effective domain models are, are those where the value of the model is ultimately greater than the cost of the model. And of course, these are hard things to estimate. It might be easier, in some sense, to estimate the cost of creating a domain model, perhaps in hours, that it takes uh, developers or architects to assemble uh, the respective information. Um, they should accurately reflect the team's understanding of the problem. Uh, one issue with doing software design up front is that even if you do a good job of uh, doing software design up front, there's a chance that the design artifacts might become obsolete as the underlying implementation changes. And so the uh, effective domain model should have a clear uh, status uh, with regard to the current implementation uh, as to whether or not they are a draft for further iteration or perhaps incomplete in some way. Uh, and then, uh, like all good design artifacts, we want to keep good version and date information uh, about our models. <clears throat> I was talking earlier about the importance of language and the importance of using a consistent language. We've probably all been taught, <clears throat> uh, at least those of us who come up with a kind of a traditional computer science background, that um, you know the the nouns in our domain often become classes in our eventual project design, uh, and then the operations can often become methods in our eventual class design, and so on. Um, it's important to understand you know, the different categories of these things and the different objects or class types that they eventually end up uh, creating in our design. We've probably also been taught that verbs generally transfer uh, or translate into methods or operations on particular objects. Um, modifiers and uh, qualifiers may indicate that uh, you know uh, certain things have a certain relationship. So for example, um, a course can be taught by many instructors here at the University of Minnesota. It might be offered in many different terms. And so all of those rules uh, constrain the relationship between uh, uh, classes of objects like course uh, and instructor, or course and term. Um, you can define terms uh, with diagrams. I've seen uh, some work that's particularly effective uh, when it uses diagrams to explain uh, certain terms, um, especially effective uh, where I've seen you know, kind of a comprehensive diagram with each of the important domain terms illustrated in a single diagram or a set of uh, diagrams. The effort to precisely define terms and use them appropriately and consistently is one of the best ways to gain insight and understanding of the domain. I encourage you to fight to understand 
what it is your user is trying to communicate and be sure that the vocabulary that you're using as you begin work on your software design is consistent with what a user of the system would use. Mm -hmm. Informal diagrams might also have a place in the uh, uh, domain model. So here's an example of just a conceptual graph. Um, it's not in any kind of standard notation or uh, anything like that. It's not a standard software deliverable, but it, it's uh, obvious uh, to most people what this represents. And so um, these uh, visuals are sometimes a very, very effective way, even if they don't necessarily conform to a given standard, such as UML uh, or uh, or uh, you know, IEEE standards and so on for software documentation. <clears throat> In our model-driven development, um, we often start the uh, modeling process uh, very early on in the planning or analysis phase. Um, and uh, a lot of, you know, some of you may not realize this, but whether you know it or not, uh, your user is expressing their uh, requirements with respect to a model. And so in that sense, it's much more about discovering what the model actually is rather than developing the model. Um, and so as part of the requirements process, your user is going to use certain language. You can ask questions to probe that language and decide how those terms should appear in your eventual uh, domain model. And then you can use things like use cases. Uh, Agile uses user stories, of course, um, to firm up and confirm that your understanding of the domain is correct. Uh, ultimately, this is an iterative process. And the purpose of writing this down, and diagramming it, is ultimately about communication and receiving validation uh, from the user. <clears throat> the overall architecture of an application determines its structure and its infrastructure. So a client-server model, for example, would necessarily mean that you'd have uh, you know, a server component and a client component. Um, and then the domain model is really about internal representation. So within the server component or within the client component, what are the different uh, kind of reusable modular pieces of software? <clears throat> and, in, in a, and in the best scenarios, of course, they would share a lot of these components, uh, so the physical components as part of the physical architecture would share some of these virtual components and ultimately reduce the amount of code that you need to write. Ambler, uh, in his uh, you know, Agile uh, you know, manifesto and subsequent uh, uh, writings and teachings, uh, came up with a set of uh, modeling principles specifically for use in uh, Agile. Um, and there are things like model as a purpose, refactor as you go, which of course is a core tenant of Agile, and uh, always have working software. <clears throat> um, also included a focus on quality work, uh, organizing for rapid feedback, uh, using simple tools, and then modeling as a team uh, as part of his uh, set of teachings. Of course, <clears throat> this isn't necessarily a, a you know, a, designed to, to break down uh, Agile uh, as a methodology. And you can do domain model modeling, whether you're uh, doing um, uh, Agile software development or even traditional waterfall development. But uh, Ambler's modeling principles apply equally well. When you're building your domain model, you want to understand and document your users' goals and including the criteria in which they're measured uh, in the language of the domain. And as you develop that language, you want to revise and refactor that. Requirements, model, and code must use the same language. And this is a core tenant that Evans comes back to. The language and the vocabulary and the terms that you use inside your uh, domain model should be consistent with the language that you use inside the requirements. Um, always be on the lookout for better abstractions and, uh, and, and clearer language. Let's next look at some specifics of uh, domain models. <clears throat> the first is that uh, not unlike uh, a textbook, uh, when a domain model should have a, a transparent and predictable structure. And so there are a couple of uh, strategies for organizing your domain model. 
Evans in his text breaks things down into entities, values, and services. We'll talk a little bit more about those. And then Code, who's written uh, uh, you know, a similar uh, set of essays, talks about uh, a set of understood archetypes that ap appear within your, um, your, uh, your, your domain model. And in fact, there's uh, a slide coming up where I'll show that you can actually use color to indicate what roles particular classes play within your eventual model. Let's start, though, by looking at <clears throat> Evans' breakdown into entities, uh, values, and services. The idea here is that the uh, classes in your model should fit into a set of categories, and you can indicate those categories uh, on your model. Um, and there's uh, some suggestions in the, in the text for how to indicate those on a class diagram, for example. Um, starting with uh, entities, and these are the things that we uh, most often talk about. An entity is typically a, a person, place, or thing. Um, it usually has a, a persistent identity, you know, so something like a car, an order with its own ID, a reservation with its own reservation number, and so on. These are really the central uh, entities, the central classes in our design. Uh, they can often represent, uh, you know, items that have a physical uh, analog. And then the, uh, you know, Evans encourages you to push as much as you can of the description of this off onto value objects, which we'll talk about next. <clears throat> Anything that uh, is a description of something that doesn't have an inherent identity is something that Evans calls a value object. One simple example of this would be a class that represents color. Um, if you had a class that represents color, and perhaps it represents the value of the color red, this is uh, immutable. If you were to change the identity of that object from red to blue, it would no longer be red. Um, unlike a car, which has a persistent identity, if you were to paint the car, for example, uh, it would still be the same car. Uh, value objects, <clears throat> they are defined inherently by their value. And you see this in a lot of frameworks, for example, like .NET and its representation of color uh, with a particular color enumeration or, uh, or class um, as a value object. Finally, services are um, operations or set of operations that are not obviously associated with any particular entity. As we uh, dig into design patterns in, uh, uh, you know, in, a, in a class, uh, for example, where you could spend more time with this, you might come up with things like factories. Most of us have, who are software designers have probably written a factory object at some point. And this is a classic example of a service. It's something that performs an operation. Maybe it creates an entity object and returns it to us. Um, and so we model these in our domain as services. Alternative, uh, an alternative to the entities, values, and services model would be to organize your domain model into a set of archetypes. Um, the, uh, this is uh, Code's archetypes, and instead of a, a three-category model, he has a four-category model. <clears throat> the party, place, or thing, which is, uh, uh, you know, usually maps most closely to an entity. He adds the concept of a moment interval which is a, a time-related uh, class. Uh, so it, you can think of it as a class or an object that represents an interval of time. And then uh, a role, <clears throat> which is uh, something, uh, you know, a way that an entity participates in uh, a particular time value. And finally, a description, which maps closely to Evan's uh, uh, description of a value type. Um, <clears throat> You can actually use, and, and, and again, in, in a short webinar, we'll go into the details, but you can actually use these archetypes uh, along with some uh, suggested colors to give your model uh, additional meaning and an addi additional sense of depth. Um, and, uh, and, and code actually has a thing called a domain neutral component, which is essentially a, a general purpose design uh, that you can map onto uh, just about any domain. At least that's the idea. When you're creating uh, your entities and values, so continuing on with Evan's model here, uh, some of the operations on them are clear and clearly associated. Uh, 
uh, with a particular object, but there are others for which it's harder to decide. Where do you put this method? Do I put it in this object or in that object, or do I put it in its own service? And so it's helpful to have a set um, um, a method, a methodology, or a, a model for assigning those responsibilities. And <clears throat> one way to do that, not the only way, but one way to do that is with uh, something called GRASP, which is a generalized responsibility assignment uh, software pattern. And this lists a series of patterns, <coughs> excuse me, um, that can be used to assign responsibilities in a particular domain model. These patterns result in high cohesion, low coupling, and overall good design. At least that's the uh, background for them. <coughs> Excuse me. One uh, final note when preparing your uh, domain models is that uh, Ambler, again from the Agile space, uh, came up with a concept of change cases. He uh, recommends uh, using something called change cases. Again, if you take our classes, we actually do some activities with these. <coughs> um, but uh, the idea of change cases is that when you're uh, preparing uh, your domain model, you want to do so with future changes in mind. We were probably all taught uh, in our uh, undergraduate uh, education that um, the uh, 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 you know, we should anticipate change with our design. Uh, unfortunately, this often results in us, <coughs> excuse me, um, this often results in us kind of over-anticipating change and uh, building in a, a kind of a, a, a you know, over-engineering over our, our software. And so this is a recipe for paralysis. The way that Ambler recommends attacking this is simply uh, documenting potential changes in change cases <coughs> and then uh, uh, making design decisions that try to reduce the impact of those uh, likely changes. So in summary, uh, the uh, domain driven approach is fairly deep and if you take our classes um, we, uh, we dig into this with a set of activities and uh, we teach a lot of design patterns as well and so we invite you to uh, you know, join us for some of those classes and uh, taking time for design eventually reduces overall system cost. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to you for moderating the questions. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it, Ken. Um, so just a couple of questions that we have for question and answer session. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A button at the top or right hand side of your screen. But just a couple of questions that came in. How much percentage of cost is typically saved by paying the upfront costs for software design? You know, it's a, it's a great question. And it, <clears throat> I've often looked for, uh, um, for research on that. I, I suppose the short answer is I don't know. Um, but uh, intuitively, if you look at the, uh, you know, the way that those, those costs are laid out over the life of the system. And, um, <clears throat> you know, sometimes I have some example spreadsheets. I didn't bring uh, any today. But, you know, even things like a, a small 10% reduction in maintenance cost uh, realized over the lifetime of a, uh, you know, a 15-year lifetime of system can be quite significant. And when you're talking about, <coughs> um, when you're talking about kind of large and expensive systems, you don't have to... Uh, you know, get uh, tremendous reductions in maintenance costs in order to justify spending, um, you know, even a few months on software design, a few months of an architect's time on software design. So I don't have any hard numbers, but just kind of intuitively reasoning about it, um, especially on larger systems, you don't have to make too much of an impact on the maintenance cost to justify, you know, many, many months or man hours of work on uh, software design. Wonderful. Definitely worth implementing that. <laughs> um, so what are some good questions to ask users when gathering requirements? Well, yeah, this is a, an interesting, uh, you know, whole other topic. It's probably worth a, a webinar on. Um, 
In fact, I was just doing an exercise with another company on this the other day. Um, you know, there's uh, several categories of questions. So uh, I would usually start by questions about the user themselves. Um, these are things that software designers don't often think to ask. They'd be things like, obviously, their name, but understanding their title, their role in the organization, um, maybe who they report to. One interesting one is, how are you measured when you, uh, you know, in the performance of your job? So if it's a certain number of uh, forms or transactions processed in a certain time frame, that would be interesting for software designers to know. Um, there's a whole other category of uh, problem definition. So there's a quote out there, and um, I'm going to be frustrated because I can't properly attribute it, but it's something to the effect of a, a problem well defined is half solved. And so, you know, oftentimes users are actually poor articulators of their problem. You know, so their problem might be that they, uh, you know, they don't have enough time in the day, for example, or you know, can't get a, a certain number of tasks done. In reality, the business problem is that there's a suboptimal process. And so asking questions of the user to try and ascertain exactly <coughs> what the, um, what the uh, underlying problem is, is one whole category of questions. It's important to ask questions about the user environment. So I'm going through a set of categories here. Um, you know, these, these are things like who are the users, what are their, uh, their educational backgrounds, uh, their familiar, familiarity with technology and computer systems in general. Um, that helps us know are we designing for an expert user scenario or are we designing for more of a consumer scenario like a walk-up kiosk or something like that. Um, a lot of those have implications in UI design as well. They help identify non-functional requirements uh, are, such as do we have to support multiple languages. Um, are our users scattered throughout the globe? Uh, do we have access to our users for training? So are we designing for ease of use or ease of learning? <coughs> um, fourth category of questions would be, um, it's not really questions, but I, uh, and I'll be honest, I, I depart from uh, maybe some traditional analysts in this uh, category in the sense that I invite you to discuss uh, potential solutions with the users. Um, the, uh, you know, I've, I've found that, you know, in a purest sense, we're supposed to move through the, the software development life cycle and gather requirements uh, before we start coming up with our design. But I've found in practice that, of course, that's not always the case. We usually head into the beginning of the software development life cycle with a particular design uh, in mind. And so, um, you know, I invite you as you're trying to gather requirements to also share potential uh, solutions with the users and and gather uh, their uh, response and, and feedback. Uh, and then that also has implications as, as far as adoption of the system down the line. If the user, uh, for example, if you sit down with the user and, uh, and you give them three potential solutions and say, uh, which one of these sounds the best to you? Well, now the user has some ownership in, uh, in what path that you're going down. And I think you'll find that they're more invested um, as the system eventually rolls out. And the final category of questions I have is usually around non-functional requirements. Uh, this would be um, things like uh, you know, performance requirements on the system. How quickly must it process uh, certain transactions? How many users must it support at a time? Um, and so on. You know, so those are five categories of things. Um, again, I think we could easily spend another hour webinar on uh, interview techniques. So. Well, thank you. Um, so this is kind of a three-part question. What are the considerations for designing a system of systems? Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So I assume by this that we're, you know, we're talking about something that might take multiple systems and kind of integrate them, right? Um, I think, uh, it, well, like any system, it's important to get an idea for what the exact uh, requirements are. And again, that's probably a, a completely different discipline and a completely different webinar. Um, but I would say that there's, uh, in addition to, we didn't get into it today, but in, in addition to the software design patterns uh, that we might teach in a software design course, there's also a set of architectural patterns uh, for integrating systems. And so I'd encourage you, if you're interested, to kind of explore that route a little bit. Um, you might call them architectural patterns or integration patterns. Um, it's really an expansion of the design pattern concept to the system level. 
it talks about how um, you know systems can relate to one another. So those are just some short ideas to explore. Great. And then the other two parts of that question kind of go hand in hand. How important is graph theory and do you have any re recommendations for books or publications regarding theory behind this? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> You know, okay, graph theory is probably, you know, depends a lot on, on the domain that you're, uh, that you're working with. So obviously graph theory has huge applications if you're doing any kind of geometric, or geographic, excuse me, um, applications, uh, route finding, path finding, uh, logistics applications, you know, so if you're UPS, you want to find a way to, <clears throat> for your trucks to, uh, um, you know, uh, kind of find the, the, the right route on delivery. Um, graph theory is big. On the other hand, there are a lot of domains where graph theory just doesn't really come into play. Uh, there's another kind of interesting meta application of graph theory, and that is, um, you know, actually using graph theory to analyze a software design in an attempt to assess the quality of the software design. Um, I know of uh, certainly some rudimentary kind of tools and even visual analysis in this area be things like looking for circular dependencies in your, uh, you know, in a complicated software design, complicated um, uh, uh, kind of, you know, representing your UML class diagram as a graph and, and trying to find cyclical dependencies, bidirectional associations, and so on, which are generally considered bad design, and you want to refactor them out. Um, and then as far as books go, so I mentioned uh, the Evans text, uh, Domain-Driven Design, um, there's a, a couple of books on uh, software design patterns. There's uh, the original, uh, what they call the Gang of Four book. It was written by, you know, four authors who are, I guess, somewhat famous or notorious within the uh, uh, computer uh, and software design fields. And that one's just called Software Design Patterns. Uh, I think there's a subtitle on it, but it's escaping me at the moment. Um, but then there's also a subsequent book out there called Design Patterns Explained, which attempts to go, you know, uh, one step uh, beyond that. Um, and then I might throw out there that, uh, um, you know, uh, McConnell uh, has a number of texts. Uh, the, the titles, the exact titles are uh, escaping me. Code Complete comes to mind. Um, if uh, folks on the line haven't uh, read that one, it's you know, it's, it's a standard that uh, most folks should read. Great. Um, when trying to use some of these design documents to communicate with business users, can you address the level, oh, give me a minute here, can you address the level of business user sophistication required for different design documents and techniques? Yeah, um, this is uh, just a, a really fun question and I think uh, maybe something that I didn't explicitly call out but that we would explore as we start to apply this stuff in a, in a class is there's a, there's, there's a nuanced difference between uh, the domain model uh, as Evans presents it and your eventual software design. The domain model has things that are important to the user in it. So, you know, you saw the example domain model earlier in the webinar from the, web, the Evans text it had, uh, you know, uh, sample terms from the domain that the, the business user should understand and that you should be able to verify uh, with the business user. Um, your eventual software design will have a bunch of other, you know, so if you look at the, the, you know, sum total of the classes in the eventual system, you'll have a bunch of classes in there that are essentially not very meaningful uh, to the user. So, for example, the, the classic example is factory objects. So we tend to create them in our uh, software designs because, you know, we need them or we want to co-locate functionality or whatever the case may be. Um, but this isn't something that a business user would necessarily need to know or understand. And so, you know, what I kind of often advocate, actually the, the terminology that I use in my class is that the domain model uh, is the thing that you share with the user and seek user validation. It should be limited to those things that the user could have uh, impact on. Understanding the user probably is not a software designer, may not understand the notion of uh, you know, classes, objects, and methods, but they should understand uh, how those particular terms relate to one another. And of course, your job is to make sure that, as the software architects, make sure that the UML is correct. It's not the business user's job to understand that. 
But I do encourage you uh, to first come up with a model that you can validate with the user that's limited to kind of their scope, their domain of knowledge. And then you can flesh that out with additional classes and objects that you need to actually implement the system. Wonderful, thank you. And then the last question. Are most companies implementing agile approaches to avoid potential change cases? <laughs> and how is this being incorporated? Yeah. Um, again, it's uh, so I've been working with a lot of different companies lately. Um, I see a uh, I see kind of a unique uh, pattern that's that's very similar across a lot of the companies. Um, so a lot of companies uh, are saying uh, in 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 their language in their vocabulary uh, that agile is very important to them. They're adopting agile. That they do agile, and so on. Um, when I ask these same companies, can I see a copy of your SOP for software development or something like that, what they give me looks a lot like Waterfall. Um, and so what's, what I think is happening is that um, Waterfall has a high, you know, for all its drawbacks, it has a high degree of what I call process transparency. Um, it's uh, very easy for people unfamiliar with software to look at a Waterfall process to understand where in the process uh, a project is, what deliverables need to be completed, uh, and so on. And so from that perspective, um, for environments which are you know, typical large companies need a lot of process transparency, um, they end up uh, practicing waterfall at the overarching level, but then they end up practicing agile uh, at the low level, uh, you know, maybe on a day-to-day on a -day basis or something like that. So you end up with what's really uh, actually a... Uh, a hybrid. I think, um, you know, change cases were, you know, Ambler's idea, and so they're, they're still very much relevant uh, in the Agile world. Um, Agile would, would advocate doing design, but doing just enough design and kind of not over-designing. And so change cases were, uh, you know, it's, again, it's Ambler's concept. Um, the idea was to uh, designed for changes that you felt would be likely as opposed to every change that you might possibly uh, think of. So, uh, you know, I, I, st I still think that the concept of change case is very useful whether you're using wa Waterfall or Agile. Great, thank you so much. That's all the questions that we have for today, so I just want to thank you again, Ken, for an excellent presentation. And as I stated at the beginning of the webinar, we will be sending out an email with a link to the presentation soon. Another thing to look forward to are some upcoming classes um, that can further supplement what you learned today. The courses you see on the slide are just a few upcoming course courses we offer. Please visit our website for a full list of classes and educational programs. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar as much as we did. Thank you and have a wonderful day.